Here's a sign. Uh, there are signs all, all around the Sarnia region um, by different companies, Imperial Oil, Shell, uh, Dow. And uh, they're promoting you know, corporate responsibility and environmental initiatives, community involvement. Because the fact of the matter is, uh, um, you know, a lot of people in the Sarnia region still work in Chemical Valley. So it becomes um, not a matter of being able to just say, well, let's shut it all down because then you essentially kill the town. I mean, there's, there's a dependency there. So uh, it's, it's a very complex uh, landscape. And here's the sign for uh, the Dow Chemical Wetlands, which is uh, that photograph on the, the back wall there. Uh, you have this, this wetland in which uh, you know, the, the, the Dow Corporation is giving us a place to walk our dogs and to recreate. But it, it also takes on a bit of a more uh, dark overtone because they're using this landscape to test species that can recuperate hydrocarbons more effectively. So it's a testing ground for them um, as well. And uh, you know, to, to talk about uh, the decommissioning of some of these sites, this is something else that I began to take interest in. Um, you know, I learned that Dow Chemical in 2006, uh, due to a ban on ethylene in Chemical Valley, uh, pulled out their uh, production entirely. And there's currently, I think it says here somewhere, uh, 15 employees that still uh, continue to work in the Sarnia region for Dow from home offices. So it's really, uh, you know, when a company like that pulls out, uh, it's a devastating, it has devastating ramifications on the community because a lot of people are forced to move or lose their jobs. As a result, I mean, housing prices in Sarnia are extremely affordable. Um, you know, for Montreal standards at least. <laughs> uh, you know, a, a friend of mine there bought a home, three-story home for $110,000 with a finished basement, including a dark room. Uh, so it, it's really, I mean, it's like a heritage home, beautiful, beautiful home. So, uh, you know, the, the, the community is, is struggling a bit economically. So all of these issues, I was working on the project, uh, not alone, but I was working with uh, the curator that I mentioned already, Lisa Daniels, and a writer uh, who's based out of, the, uh, out of Windsor and works at the University of Windsor. She's also an artist herself. Her name is Lee Rodney. And uh, Lee, actually her task was to kind of manage a blog for the project. Uh, the URL is underneath here, lamptonbetweenthelines.tumblr.com. We had a hard time kind of coming up with a name for the project initially, but uh, the blog, you know, I'm happy with the title. So it was called Sensing Place, Lampton Between the Lines. And uh, this was a place that Lee and I could uh, post our ideas, post our research, um, find a way of kind of categorizing some of the themes that we were interested in. And she was very influential on the project for me as well because uh, she shared in my point of view and we were fascinated by very similar things. Um, you know, she, uh, she it, it also helps that, she, you know, living in, in Windsor, she runs, um, an initiative and has for a number of years called the Border Bookmobile. So uh, she's very interested in, in borders and uh, not that you know we're dealing with the borders between nations or the borders between uh, provinces, but there is something, in, especially in the industrial photographs, of skirting the perif periphery of uh, Chemical Valley. And so the boundaries between the residential communities and uh, the industrial site uh, became a, a preoccupation of ours. And so, uh, you know, we collectively worked on uh, stories and posted photographs. Uh, this particular entry tells of a story when we went at night into Chemical Valley, I wanted to shoot some video. And uh, we came across uh, a worker for Esso and he came out and uh, I, I noticed right away, the first thing he did was he wrote down the license plate of my vehicle on a pad of paper and then he put it in his shirt and then he came up to us and he said, uh, not that you don't have any right to be here, but just curious, what are you doing? And I think this is a very different attitude than what would have happened in the 1960s or 1970s uh, because by now they're used to you know, the negative portrayal uh, of the industry in the media. So he came up to me and he said, you know, 
yeah, you can be here, but what are you doing? And we told him, uh, I'm just making some video of the smoke coming out of the stacks. And he was like, that's not smoke, that's not smoke. <laughs> and so uh, we said to him, well, what is it? And he was like, uh, I don't really know. But then we, we discussed different terms for a while and we decided on mist as a possible alternative. So it was the mist, <laughs> the vapeur coming out of the stacks. <clears throat> Another thing I did in August of 2011 is I ran a three-day workshop with teenagers in the Sarnia region. Uh, it was a workshop called Making Tracks. So we took these GPSs that we had purchased for the project and uh, different teens uh, were able to, um, you know, we, we, we hand drew maps, memory maps of some favorite spots of theirs and I taught them sport orienteering because that's a pastime of mine and uh, we talked about photography as well, and then uh, we ended up making this little publication out of the project where uh, they had to draw a memory map to a favorite location of theirs in Sarnia, and then we all put our maps in a box, and after lunch we selected randomly someone else's map, and then went to try to retrace our steps to that location. So it was a way of involving a different uh, sector of the community, you know, these teenagers, and some of them came back and took out GPSs uh, to con contribute to the project. And another thing that we organized, I worked with this group, uh, also part of the gallery uh, staff. They were called the Sarcasm, which was the Sarnia Area Research Collective of Arts, Science, and Music, I believe. So it rolls off the tongue even more than the Judith and Norman Alex Art Gallery. Uh, they have something about uh, acronyms there. So these were really great guys though, sarcasm. What they did was they came up with um, this idea to do bike tours in the community. So uh, we had like a little stereo and it was beautiful summer nights and they, they put together a publication uh, which we see in the foreground here where they took uh, archival photographs from the area and we highlighted key sites and we told stories about these, uh, these, these points of interest. And sometimes there were, you know, photogra they were photographs of architecture that had since been torn down and uh, other times they were, uh, you know, photographs of events that had transpired at those locations. And we spent the evening riding around uh, Sarnia and Point Edward and uh, going through these sites. So these were all ways of, you know, involving the members of the community in the project, uh, and you're probably still wondering what this has to do with oil and the pictures that exist on the wall. So I'll get to that right now. Uh, so uh, to show you another map, th this is um, the, the broader uh, map that was produced by the GPS units. So uh, these sh this shows now all of the, the GPS tracks. Here is the St. Clair River, so this is kind of like the, the river road on one side, this is the river road on the other side. Chemical Valley is kind of in this, in this zone. And here's the site of Oil Springs. So uh, maybe six months or eight months after I began the project, and I was going back, um, well I went back in total six times to Sarnia. So, uh, and, and usually I would spend between four days and a week there. And within the first six months, I was brought by somebody in the community, actually it was the Lambton Outdoor Recreation Club. They took a GPS and they went to the site of Oil Springs. And what I was encountered with there, or what I encountered there was uh, this ancient way of extracting oil from the ground. And uh, I knew as soon as I saw this landscape um, and smelled this landscape and saw the beautiful light in this landscape, that I wanted to work with this as an aspect of the project, that this would be a critical part of the project. So basically to summarize the history there is in 1858, uh, they began to extract petroleum from the ground. The First Nations population had been using seeps of oil that came naturally to the surface for centuries for uh, topical, you know, aid to, to cure rheumatism and arthritis and, uh, you know, the, the history of oil runs very deep. Um, but it was in 19, or, sorry, 1858 that uh, the first well was, was dug as the Americans would like to differentiate uh, in the region of Oil Springs. Uh, and I'll get to the American side near the end of my presentation, but 
Uh, here we have some illustrations of some of the equipment. And uh, if you have seen the exhibition already, or if you know after the presentation you'll have a chance to see the video on the other side of this wall, which uh, shows some of this equipment in action. So what I was really captivated by is uh, this equipment is still running today. A few things have changed. Uh, this is the inside. Actually, you don't see this in the video at all. This is the inside of the powerhouse. And so this is what it looks like. We have right here this small motor, which is about the size of my head. It's uh, an electric motor, which through a series of step-up wheels, uh, rocks back and forth these two sets of ash timbers. And those go, up, go throughout the fields. And those are what power the pump jacks. So it's this one small electric motor, which probably uses the same amount of electricity as my refrigerator and uh, some of the other appliances in my home per day, that will power up to 50 pump jacks uh, in the oil fields. So this system was developed by a man named John Henry Fairbank, and the Fairbank family is one of um, around realistically 10 families that have been multi-generational families in the region that have been extracting petroleum since this time. And they still operate today, and it's still a private enterprise. It's not a museum as such. Uh, they have a contract. It's one of the longest uh, contracts, uh, you know, in, in uh, North America at least, in terms of selling the oil to Imperial Oil. So Imperial Oil comes once a week, and they take a tanker of crude oil out of oil springs and they drive it to the refineries in the Sarnia area and refine it. So, I mean, it's not a tremendous amount of oil. It's not going to power, you know, Montreal. It's not, it's not going to, it's just a drop in the demand of, you know, worldwide petroleum per day, but it's still a marketable enterprise for them. And so as such, it's, it, it, it is the longest operational oil field in the world. And the reason why it still exists is um, there was another community. I'll just zip back here for a minute. And there's another community just up here, and it's called Petrolia. And that's where the name of the, the exhibition comes from. And there's only one photograph. It's this one here, which is a museum, by the way. There's only one photograph from Petrolia in the exhibition. But in Petrolia, that's where the rail came in. And at the time, uh, of John Henry Fairbank and you know in the 18 late 1850s early 1860s they were using these wagons with wooden wheels and they were going along a plank road which was just a crude road no pun intended uh, of, of trees that were felled uh, and and they were hauling this oil one tank load at a time you know this is maybe 20 30 barrels of oil and they were hauling that all the way to Sarnia so when the rail came in uh, they all moved to Petrolia because the railhead was there. And it was, there was still oil in the ground in oil springs, but there was also oil in Petrolia and the railway was there. So that's why, you know, it was abandoned essentially and then uh, a few families still maintained their property there. And that's why four generations later we still have uh, the oil men of, of Lambton County. So. Here are a few archival photographs. Uh, you know, I often say when we think of oil, we don't typically think of southwestern Ontario. We think today as Canadians of Alberta, right? Uh, but at that time, I mean, this was the oil sands, essentially, of the 19th century. These were the Victorian oil sands. And uh, the, these archival photographs that I found in uh, the archives of Lambton County attest to that. I mean, there were derricks and pump jacks and uh, equipment, you know, that, that um, ravaged the landscape. And the landscape really has been altered permanently by this industry. But what I find fascinating is going there today, it's been reclaimed. And so that process of reclamation is something that I wanted to photograph, fo focus on in the photographs. And it was an analogy that I wanted to dra draw to the images of the industry. Because in the images of the industry, you see these scars of the industry that are being overtaken by vegetation. So that was the visual parallel. Um, and in reading the you know, histories, like the Black Creek, which is the image we see here, 40,000 barrels of oil a day were pouring into the Black Creek when the first gusher, 
Like in There Will Be Blood, you know, you have this massive stream of oil that comes into the sky suddenly. They were unable to stop the flow. So 40,000 barrels were going into the Black Creek. They went down the Black Creek into the St. Clair River, and they wound up all over the yachts of wealthy Americans from Michigan. And at first, they were agitated, and then they realized it was crude, and they followed it all the way back to the source and just set up shop in, in Oil Springs. <clears throat> so here's the website of Fairbank Oil. Since 1861, they've been incorporated. 